very fast and also has to be served very fast. So that is where the requirement for low latency comes into play. Also, the key important thing is, as you can imagine, you need to have high availability. So nothing can't go down so that people who can't make investment oh, decisions or financial decisions can use more. So this is the key platform for which we need low latency. And that's why uh, we look for uh, improving as much as possible to give high performance for the users of our platform. So, there are a lot of different ways you can do data storage and retrieval. I'm pretty sure uh, some of these you might have seen and some of these which I have used in my career. So you can build that data storage with pure file system or then there are abstractions built on file systems like Visa and there were network based databases, uh, hierarchical databases, relational databases, MPPs and whatnot. Right? But the fundamental thing is if you want to use it very well, you want to make sure that you understand the fundamental principles of this. So everybody, ha every one of these has got unique uh, behavior, unique uh, uh, advantage to be used. For example, uh, network. Nowadays they call this you know, graph database, right? So there's a unique use case which can be used, which can be efficient. So the bottom line is you need to understand the fundamental principles of each of these different data store techniques or technologies what is available. And in that sense, if you look at it in a relational world, uh, I'm pretty sure most of you are familiar with relational databases. What do you do? When you come to a relational database, you first understand the use case, what do you, you what for which you want to build a, a relational database and you uh, identify the entities and relations and you build a logical model, data model. That means you do normalization, denormalization and whatnot. You just go through a few cycles of it. And then you do a physical data model. That is pretty much what you do is try to understand what is the best way to represent the data on the storage level. And then once you implement it, you start with you. So in short, what you do when you do the cycle, what you are trying to do is you are trying to satisfy uh, relational algebra as well as trying to stick or trying to follow the principles laid out by the relational data model. In that sense, we need to understand what H base is and what its basic principles are. If you look at H base at its core, it's an ordered key value store. So that is primarily is the key to understand. In, in a simplistic way, if you look at it, it's a key value store. And then it is distributed. So what does that mean? So on, on the storage level, it's keys and values stored. So that means if you have queries which is very pointed to get any key value, key, key, va key being passed and you want a value out, that is the best you can get out of edge base on a fundamental level. Does it make sense? So that's, that's the key. You need to, when you're trying to think about a use case on the data model, you would need to think about what, what's the best you can get out from edge base and the best you can get out from edge base is if you're able to make a query on the key level. And if you're giving a key level, the, return, uh, the, the performance at which it returns the value back is the best you can get out of it. And if you, and on, on, the, on, the, on, the, on the on the fundamental level, it's also lexicographically ordered in the way so that the retrieval can be much faster from the space perspective. Mm -hmm. And distributed, why it is distributed? The distribution is done so that you can leverage multiple machines to um, store and process the data. So the two principles we need to think about when we are doing modeling is that it's a key value store at its core and it can be distributed across uh, multiple machines so that you can leverage multiple machines to do the work for us. So this is the fundamental principles we need to think about. And then on top of that principles, then it gives you an abstraction, which is it gives a user a table or view. Like it's just a, not a key value, can give us a view of a, uh, a table row, and it gives versioning and also acidity. We look at acidity, what kind of acidity we get from HPEX. How does the table row view is uh, a 
match you internally in edge space. So if you look at it, the key has got, I'm, I'm stripping up uh, internals, but keeping the important concept from an application perspective. That's got a row ID, that's got a column ID, and a timestamp, and then it was, and it, it stores the value for that whole key. And now, we think about it, so in the storage level, it keeps the key value, as we talked about, it keeps in the order, lexicographical order, which is the key and the column, and the timestamp, and the values. But the abstraction, what does it give you, is it gives a value, it gives a view of key and column one, column two, column three, an abstraction which is everybody is familiar with. So that is, that's how it achieves it. It just stitches together and gives it back to the application user, the keys and the values. And a column, column not fine. And from the versioning perspective, as I said, the key consists of the key value, the column name, and the timestamp. So it uses the timestamp to do the versioning. And internally, it uses the, the, the timestamp to keep in a descending order. So what that means is when you do a get or a read, it gives you the latest version of the value to you. And that's how it achieves the versioning concept. And then acidity, right? So if you think about it, HBase gives acidity or accountability at the row level. That means if you write, uh, it, the whole row uh, data fails or succeeds. So that's the uh, acidity. If you think about RDMS, RDBMS, we have a different level of acidity, but here it's on the row level. Consistency. It gives you consistency at a point in time. So that means if something is written at that point in time, whatever the data, you get the consistent view of that data for us. And isolation, because the isolation is one of the things which as a database user you would expect. The isolation for the reads is achieved through the MVCC, that is meaning it gives a, it takes a, snap, it gives a snapshot view and then it gives uh, the reads at that snapshot point in time and for the writes it takes, it gives row logs. So if there's two writes happening at the same time, uh, one, both of them tries to take a lock on it and whoever gets locked or the first one who comes in gets locks and then that's actually the rights. And durability, and pretty much the durability is like anything which is acknowledged as written, it's durable. So if you think about this, all the fundamental principles, what we need to be thinking about when you are doing a database design in a space perspective. So it gives us uh, it's a key value store, it is, uh, it is distributed, it gives acidity, and it gives versioning capability. So, when we evaluate any use case for which uh, high latency, uh, sorry, low latency is expected, uh, we think about these factors, what I just listed out, and we think that we, 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 we look at it whether it is, uh, if the data can be represented in a key value uh, store internally, and also think about the ways that we can't do the relationship, so that means you need to denormalize the data, like for example, most of the use cases currently in the RDBMS, if you want to move to a, uh, in Hedgebase, we think about whether, uh, without the relationship, what will, what will we do? We do need to do denormalization. If denormalization happens, what is the growth of the size of data? Because in some cases, the growth of data is so big that you will not be able to load the data into HBase in the time what we want to get into so that it can be service to the users. And also, if you are familiar with RD members, we normally create secondary indexes when you want to do performance improvement, which can't be done because here the key whatever we use, uh, it acts as the index in, in the other fields. And also, from the data perspective, we think about it, and also we think about the querying perspective. We want to make sure that there is no skews in, in terms of queries, what is happening on this data. So what's that mean? So if we have uh, if we have natural keys, which which makes it the distribution of the data uh, much more for one set of one set of keys, and the others has got uh, lower number of data for the other set of keys. That means there's a hot spot, meaning you will have a lot of the queries and the load going against a set of data, which is 
uh, which makes the performance very slow. So that's something we consciously look at it and see whether we can mitigate it by using, say, synthetic keys on top of whatever we have. For example, you have different uh, ticker symbols like IBM, Google, and whatnot. Some of them may have uh, more, for example, in the use case, some of them has more data for one of the keys, but not the rest of the uh, ticker symbols. So if, what do you think about is whether we can create synthetic keys on top of it so that this can be distributed properly. So that's something to validate, to make sure that whether we should be able to do on an ongoing basis so that the use case uh, or the data doesn't become so skewed in one area. At the same time, you have keys created, you have distributed the data and whatnot, but if you have queries which is adapt, which is always happening for one set of data, then again you are not leveraging HBase to its uh, its potential. So you have created you have created the table, you understood that it's a key value store, it can be represented properly in key value store. You have did uh, uh, all the keys so that can be distributed properly, but when you look at the queries, the queries are going to one set of data, uh, which it makes it much more uh, a hot spot so that they are again you not be able to leverage the best of the page piece. So these are some of the things when we do the data modeling, we look at and make sure that we mitigate all these issues as much as possible so we get a very good data model and be able to use it appropriately. So, gone through this use, these steps and we got the good database and the data model, you know that the queries are good to be, uh, the, the data model is good so that it can be uh, used in a better way in the query perspective and get the best performance out of HBase. What text do you do in, in terms of uh, uh, data modeling and usage? What we do is the physical side of HBase to see what else we can leverage or what, what else we can leverage from HBase perspective to see whether we can improve the query performance. So, quickly, uh, this is the write part. As you know, when a write comes in, it goes to memory, which is the mem store, we call it as, and, uh, sorry, it first writes into the wall, to makes it persistent, which is a uh, write uh, uh, ahead log, and then it writes into memory. And as the memory gets filled up, it flushes and it creates files, right? And if you look at the files, you have blocks. So lock return, uh, data is written in blocks. So the blocks, you can set it up when you create the table. You can set the block size, say, 64K or 16K or 8K. And also, it writes indexes so that when uh, the request comes in, it knows which blocks to be read into memory. So on the right side, it may use its product. So we have an index block and also room filters. So that's what happens in the right part. Right so let's look at the read part. So when the read happens, assuming that the data is not in memory, what happens is it uses the index, looks at the blocks, which needs to be read, and it reads into the block cache. And also if there's any latest updates happened in the store, it merges and uses the data. So this is the high level sequence of steps which happens in reads and writes. So knowing all this, how can we improve the performance? So as we know, to on the read part, because we are more concerned about the read latencies, on the read part, the best you can get out is if you have more data in the cache. So the if you can pack as much as data what you, what, what you want to read into the cache, then you get a better performance so that you don't have to go through this. And also, you can increase the cache size and make it bigger so that you get more uh, data into the cache and it can be uh, so much quickly. But there's a catch, we'll get back to that on the large cache size, what happened, but let's look at the first two items, what we have. Block cache, right? So you created a table and you said 64 key has the block size. So what happens is, say, I, I for, for a key, I keep, I keep 10, 10 years worth of data. But the query is always the first one year worth of data. Right? So the 10 year worth of data may fit into 64K, but only the one year data which you all normally request fits in say 8K or 4K. Right? So what happens is when you read, if you have 64K as the block cache size, when you read, you are 
you are you are loading the cache with a lot of data which you normally don't use. So that means in the block cache, instead of using all the 64K, you are missing out or you are only using 16K of data. So what you want, what you want to do is see whether that's one of the objectives is to pack as much of data into the block cache. So now here, even though you are using the block cache, but your query is using only 16 or 8K of data, but you are building up 64K of data. So what you can do is think about whether you can in decrease the size of the block cache from say 64K to 16K or 8K depending upon your use case. So that means you have more data in cache which is much more usable which can be used to retrieve data much faster on the read side. So that's one way to pack your data into memory. So some of the benchmarks we did, as you can see, the same queries uh, you can see there's a bigger improvement on when you decrease from 64 to 16 GB. So this is some tests we have done earlier to see what's the impact of uh, having uh, slices which is much closer to what we have, what we need for the queries to be satisfied. The one catch there is to be remembered is, as I said, for each of the block cache, uh, block, uh, when you're writing the like disk, it also writes indexes. So there is an increase in the index size, uh, index block sizes for when you decrease the blocks. So that's obvious, right? Because we have more blocks, so that means you have more index entries. So that has to be just to be aware of from that perspective. The next way, of what else we can do to improve the cache usage, right? So there's when I, when I initially showed the key, we had the key and the column identifier and the timestamp. I didn't specify the column uh, identifier. The column identifier can have and one more qualifier called the column family, as you all know. Column family makes the data to be written in a second set of files than the same files. So whenever there's a flush happens, if you have a column family, it will go to a set of files for that column family. So think about this. So now we have built the uh, uh, cache much more efficient. Now what you can do is you can look at your uh, queries up and say, okay, column one is uh, column one and column three are being queried quite often, but column two and column four is rarely being uh, called or used in your queries. So what I can do now is, as I said, I can create uh, two column families in the table and. I can say the low uh, used columns can go into the second column family and the first column family, then the first column family. So what it, that in turn does is, if you had all the columns in a single column family, you would have say you have stored two rows in each uh, cache block. Now by moving that into a different column family, what you can do is you can create a pack more uh, call, uh, rows or the column values for that row in the block cache at the same time for there will be sometimes when the column uh, count in the column family too will be red so it will also be in the cache but you have more data packed into the cache so that's the two two different ways you can achieve or you can uh, you can get the columns or the, the cache data uh, much more useful to the queries what you want to retrieve in your in your, in your case. So that's that's one way. So you have the good data model, then now you are looking at the uh, cache to see how much you can pack in the memory so that your read latencies are much better. What else we can do? Right. So compactions. Um, I'm pretty sure everybody knows a compaction, but just a, just a good, uh, quick overview. As I said, there's multiple files created, then you do a flush and you have uh, data updates happening on the key values, they may sit down any of the files and there may be deletions happening. And due to compaction, here it is primarily major compaction, what we do is we the major compaction will look through all the stored files and combine it and make a single file so that uh, the read is much more performant. So that's that happens uh, in, 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 in database, uh, in HBase. So it's part of the regular HBase operations. Uh, 
uh, minor compactions and major compactions. But the key here is to remember that when major compaction runs, uh, it uses a lot of resources. But if you're looking at saving milliseconds in your queries, you want to make sure that you have the first, all the resources in the cluster available for your queries. So what one of the things you can do is try to see whether you can schedule the major compaction uh, off peak time or to regularly run it so that it doesn't run kick on uh, during the during the query processing. So that's something you can think about how to do it. Uh, even better would be to see uh, uh, if you have a use cases which is much more sensitive to the data in, in, in kind of in kind of this query uh, performance where you need multi millisecond latencies because some other cases we have five milliseconds is the best uh, worst case scenario you can get. What we do is we just um, uh, even make sure that the, the compactions doesn't run during, during the uh, online online business online time. The other thing we we want to look at is to be able to enable short circuits. How many people are familiar with short circuit reads? Just to be uh, sure. So short circuit reads are in the HDFS level. If you are using the HDFS as your data store. Um, short circuit is read is something you want to enable so that you get the best performance um, out of um, uh, HDFS. So in short circuit you see it, normally what HPS does is it goes through HDFS data mm -hmm. node and data node to use TCP IP to get the data back into HPS. That's like multiple uh, contexts which are happening and it is slower than what you get if it is uh, a short circuit read. The key point to remember here is for short circuit read, the data needs to be local to the region server. So that is the key point to remember. So uh, 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 as we go along, when we look at the, uh, the status of the cluster, what you want to do is to see what is the uh, data locality, and you need to keep make sure that the data locality is 100% or close to 100% so you can, can leverage the short circuit reads. So one, 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 one of the ways to do is to get the compaction running so that the major compaction running it, it, it improves the improves the, uh, 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 the data locality so that you can get the best performance for your gets and reads. Uh, so that's on the HPA side what we can do. The next is uh, garbage collection because as you know, uh, garbage collection happens and the any garbage collection happens during the uh, read time, uh, the performance get impacted, especially uh, spikes in the performance, uh, the latencies uh, we want to avoid. And here is where it comes into play when you increase the block cache. We talked about whether we can increase the size of the block cache in memory. So that means when you increase the size of the block cache, uh, uh, on heap block cache, what happens is uh, the, the performance of the garbage collector gets bad, so you want to make sure that uh, uh, the, the garbage collection time is minimized. So one of the features, what HBase gives is the off heap cache, or the bucket cache. I think you might have heard about the new versions of uh, off heap hash coming up. Also in H2P 2.0, you have uh, everything as off heap, not even uh, uh, anything you need uh, heap about uh, for the work done. Here you need the heap memory or the block cache and heap is primarily to get the index blocks. And also uh, the version before 2.0, any data which needs to be read has to be on the in-memory cache. So when read happens with off heap hash, the data come into off heap and it goes to the heap, which was they called as L1 and L2, and then it goes to read. It gets served to the uh, user. Uh, once the L1 cache, which is the on heap cache filled, uh, any data, if it has to bring more data, it gets to a, it goes back to the off heap cache, which is the L2 cache. But with the HTTP 2.0, you don't have that order. Uh, we are looking forward to get that implemented and see how best it improves the performance. But at this time, you can enable the off heap hash, which is primarily the bucket cache. Bucket cache. So here are some numbers. If you look at it, uh, uh, even if you increase the off heap cache and the cache size has become so big from 61 GB to 93 GB, you can see the performance, the read performance pretty much stays uh, stable. It's not, if you do the same thing in a heap uh, cache, the performance will be much better, 
might be as good as what you see here. Um, and also, the spikes you see on the bottom, the last max latencies, uh, we are hoping that when, the, when we get the SQB 2.0, when everything is uh, off peak cache, uh, then it will be much more performant. We don't get the spikes. So that's another way you can improve the uh, GC process. Uh, as usual, anybody who has dealt with the GCs, you want to look at uh, uh, what are the options available depending upon what kind of GC you are using. I just picked up the CMS, uh, just a guideline. This is just some other points to think about if you are a new user coming into the space, what things to look at and how to improve. So, uh, fine tune the GC so that improves your build performance as well. Uh, so, I quickly touched base about the availability. We need a high availability in terms of queries. So, so far we talked about uh, one server of HP. You know, this is the high level diagram about HBase, how it works. So, think about a uh, row uh, sitting in our region server 6, and region server 6 goes down. So, what will happen for that query coming to that row to be retrieved to the user? What we are seeing is sometimes it takes seconds for the data to be retrieved and returned back to the user. So how we can improve that performance, so that's one of the features Bloomberg uh, implemented in HBase, uh, which is called the region replication. So with region replication enabled, what happens is, by default, you can set how many region server the data has to be replicated to. So in this case, say two. So if two region servers has got data in it. So if R6 goes down, still the data can be retrieved from R2 much faster. It will not be as good as in low milliseconds, it will be milliseconds, but it will not be like as slow as the, but it will not be high as the seconds what we see if you want to, but trillions of goes down and the door has to return back. So that's something to look at if you want to improve the performance. So it, it has got a few changes you need to make. Uh, you need to make some changes on the cluster level configuration. Uh, you need to create the table with the reach of how many replications you want to deploy. And also on the application side, you need to make sure that uh, you need to set what kind of consistency you want when you do a query. You can say, I want timeline consistency, that means even if it's a stale data, which is in the second data, uh, second region server, I'm fine with it. So that's something to look at. And the primary call timeout would set, like if the, prime, if the first call to the primary uh, region server, if it's not returning the data within that time period, then it will make the secondary call and get the data for it. So you can set the tune the timing um, after which you want to make the secondary call and get the data back. The one thing to remember about that is if you reduce the um, time millisecond, like say first you set at 3000, and as you uh, reduce the time milliseconds, <coughs> the number of stale calls, even though the hour, none of the region servers when didn't go down, um, there may be additional calls being made to the secondary because it may be a few seconds off here and there, two milliseconds off here and there, so that means the secondary calls are made and the number of our, uh, calls going on, the network traffic going in the cluster is higher. So what we are seeing is 50 or 40 milliseconds in our environment seems to be a good timeout for the primary calls and if, if below that it becomes uh, sometimes an uh, overhead, not, not just helping. Uh, these are some other things to think about. Uh, from the start, if the database has to be uh, uh, pre-split, that's, that's something you want to make sure that when new systems coming into this space, they do this. Uh, one key thing is to the third point about no read cache. So if there is any reads you are making in the application, you want to make sure that you don't, uh, if you don't want that to be cached, if it's not going to be repeated, what you can do is say, I don't want that to be cached so that the cache is not this, uh, that not uh, having or not, 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 not filled with data which you don't need. So that in that way, as we talked about earlier, the block cache can be kept in much, in a part of much, much better position and you get a good uh, uh, performance out of it. Uh, so all things you need to start looking at, I'm not giving the specifics because every version has got different uh, 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 metrics, but key things from the get and the performance but you want to make sure that uh, cash hit ratio, data locality, uh, some of these metrics you want to start monitoring and see uh, how you can uh, tune from then on. So, 
this is a high level what we do when we get new um, applications coming on the edge space to make sure that um, they get the performance. We evaluate it first and then make sure that we do all these steps, what we have learned so far, to make it much more performant. Uh, In summary, as I said, just familiarize with the principles see, to see whether the use case fits into these principles to get the best. If you are so concerned about like five millisecond latencies, what you can live with for a query, uh, you can use what all the developer is developing, like say, you follow our session. But the key is to make sure that it it, it fits the edge base uh, uh, core principles. So if we can make sure that, that that's done, then that the rest of things is pretty much mechanical. You can just look at all these options and various tuning options and do that and make it better. That's all I had. I think I have a few minutes if you want any questions. Just like I said, to upon uh, the machines and the configuration. So there's different set of machines. I can give the, uh, okay, I can give a round of it be like a HDD plus uh, one version with so much memory and whatnot. Um, what we are seeing is uh, per node, uh, it can be depending upon, depending upon the cluster and the node, uh, it varies. I, I, I can't give the. the what would be the range? Uh, as I said, it depends on which we are seeing. We are seeing uh, ranges varying up to uh, 400k per node. Uh, but as I said, depending upon whether you are using HDD, SDD, how much memory you have, what is the query return value size, and what. So it's it's not like a specific example, but I can say that it may go up to the point of four and the uh very small function. Four hundred feet per node is small. Four hundred feet per node is number of uh guess I would say. Uh, it depends. I think in some cases you may want to think I'm just giving an idea of what the uh, 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 yeah. Uh, yeah. I think you don't want to but go to the index. Go. Yeah. Yeah, so yeah. I, should, I should show that thing. I showed that index like you want to think about the increase in index. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Keep it small. We haven't anything done on ourselves, but what we we balance between, uh, like if you start going to 4K or 8K, sometimes we stick with uh, 16K. But the increase is. Okay. Uh, Do you have some data? Uh, how much percentage does average is of the increase in four or five years? Size K is what it was for each new server. So when it was the same table, when it was set as 16K, and say for example it was 266K on the first, but went to 426K. Okay. So it's like, I think I, if I remember correctly, it's 60 to 70 percentage. Yeah, 60 to 70 percentage. Yeah. Would you like to show us how to uh, 
this policy and the major compassion policy. Uh, as you said before, you said uh, you will do the first great action, but uh, as the region become larger and larger, you still need to meet the scene to split the region or compassion the region. So when you're doing these actions, the quality will get impacted. Um, can you ask about your policy for this? So, uh, major call action, as I said, we, when, when there are cases where you need to have uh, so uh, low latency, we make sure we try to make sure that we run regularly off uh, and off peak time major call action so that major call action doesn't get in. But we still need the minor compactions run as a case that we want to uh, kinder what the space does. As we increase the, the load, we keep monitoring to see this way out. But we haven't seen most of the cases with the minor compression. But major compression, since we run regularly, we, get, uh, we don't get impacted by the minor compression. That's one thing we do. Free uh, split from the split perspective is the same default splitting uh, algorithm that is used in this space. It is because they have different increases, uh, like as you know, it's not a fixed uh, range policy. Um, it uses the different ranges. It, has, it splits the uh, uh, regions into if you look at it, uh, the default right now, it's like it goes to a certain point and it splits and splits and splits. The way we, uh, for, for, for the high, uh, low latency uh, cases, what we do is uh, the, the injections or the data loads primarily happens, uh, again, not with puts and patch puts. We do uh, loads using uh, uh, incremental load or the bulk load utility. Uh, so the splits doesn't happen quite often in most of the use cases where we see we are we are we want like, uh, less than ten milliseconds. Uh, that's, that's how we do it. Okay. Can explain offline. I have a lot of times. So what if your all the data change? How do you update your test data? How do you create your current uh, to more cycle? Uh, you uh, 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 the origin data change yeah. and how do you oh, or, or origin change? Origin change. Oh, okay. Uh, we haven't got any scenarios at least where the original data changes because it's pretty much the data the use case what we use are like well defined uh, market data coming in, for example. So there is nothing, uh, we haven't come across the situation, but uh, I'm quite happy to discuss it.
就先可能只能不能休息了，然后就只能进行下一下。那我先取一下我个人的一个稿子。那么我们的下一个项目的话是由陈哲，来自于中国电信，他带来的演讲题目是 h b a s e at China Telecom， 就他们在中国电信当中实践的一些应用。那这个也和我们每个人的呃上网习惯啊息息相关。那我们欢迎陈哲给我们带来他的演演讲题目。